ran across this interesting little thing on the internet that God formed us, sin deformed us, Jesus can transform us. And that kind of gets the heart of the matter of what we want to discuss this morning for the few minutes that we have, talking about reasons why we need Jesus. I think probably most of us here this morning recognize and understand the importance of Jesus in our lives. Sadly, there's a lot of people in the world that do not appreciate it. And it can also be a problem that we may be aware of all that Jesus has done, but we kind of forget about it. And it, it loses its effectiveness. It loses its impact. It's kind of like when we first become a Christian, we're very impressed by that. Uh, sometimes we're even moved to tears by, by what Jesus has done. But then as time goes by, our heart, we, it kind of calcifies. We get a little bit more jaded in, in our attitude. And uh, whenever we hear the story of Jesus Christ, it doesn't quite, quite move us the way that it used to. And I realize that's the way a lot of things are in life. It, gets, it kind of gets, as we sometimes say, old hat, and uh, it, it loses its, its newness and its freshness. And I think that we, we really have to work on, on, on trying to understand and appreciate and value all that, that Christ has done for us. We can forget, and, and we can become uh, d desensitized about that. So I just want to cover a, a few things. Uh, the passage that was just read for us in, in Peter uh, there, there's some, some interesting things, and I want us to look specifically at verse 10. And he says, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So I really want to focus on these four things that Peter says God in Christ can do for us. These four words. That Jesus can help perfect us, confirm us, strengthen us, and establish us. Those are four interesting words. We're going to look at their definitions, and we're going to look at some other companion passages of scriptures that will help us to gain some insight and perspective on what uh, Peter was talking about here. Uh, we, we've spoken before about this, this word uh, perfect. Uh, and, and what it means, a lot of times in the scriptures, it's not meaning that, that we're completely flawless, although that's, that's one particular definition when we use the word perfect. But, but in, in context throughout scriptures, a lot of times it means it will be complete in, in, eyes God, in the eyes of God. Uh, the ESV and NIV uh, uses the word restore instead of the word perfect in this instance. And, and that's... That's kind of interesting. I, I've always uh, appreciated it be, whenever I do a study to look at the different translations, and, and you can learn a lot uh, from that, from, from the various word usages. Uh, Strong's Concordance says that it means to repair or to adjust. And we can see that that's certainly accurate in what Jesus does for us. As, as we mentioned earlier, we've been deformed by sin. And, and so Jesus can help us with that. He can help repair us. And, and in order to repair us, we have to make some adjustments, don't we, in, in our lives. We have to make some changes. That's what repentance is all about, when, when we decide to, to change in direction. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. In other words, this means that Jesus can help us in satisfying all of God's requirements, that, that we live pure lives, godly lives, righteous lives, all those things that, that we often uh, talk about. Well, as we've been saying, Jesus helps us to restore our spiritual health. You know, especially in this past year and a half, we've been really, really conscious about our physical health and trying to take care of us. And, and you know, we're wearing these masks and we'd rather not wear them. And, and it, it's like, it kind of goes back and forth. And and we here now, I mean, some of us are, have gone back to wearing masks, and people ask me about it and say, well, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm kind of confused. I don't know, should I wear it or shouldn't it? But, you know, things just seem to get a little bit gloomier and worse, and so that, that seems to be the safe, cautious thing to do, but I realize that that's a decision that each person needs to make uh, for themselves. But, but we're interested in our health, and, and we want to protect our health, and especially with this pandemic, we also have to think about other people around us. We can't just think about ourselves because 
you know, if we do become infected, we, we could spread that to other people. We don't want to spread it to, to our family, our, our children, grandchildren, or o older people in our family who, who are perhaps a little more vulnerable. We don't want to do that. So, so we're really focused on our health. And when we get sick, we need help. And we see people throughout the country that they're making their way to the hospital. You know, say, hey, I, I need help. I can't breathe. They need oxygen. Or perhaps they're going to need other treatments to go on. And so they're going to the hospital so that their health can be restored. So that they can be healed. And a lot of people are. A lot of people do get better. You know, so often we, we, we kind of are fixated and focused on, on all the negative and the deaths. But there are a lot of people that do survive and are able to be helped and, and, and recover. And that's what Jesus does for us from, in a spiritual perspective. We need Christ. Uh, Jesus is once referred to as, as the great physician. And, and we, we need a great physician to, to help us with, with our sin problem that we have. We go back to Peter, 1 Peter 2, verses 24 and 25. It says, And he himself, referring to Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Think about that. Christ is the guardian of our souls. He's helping us. We need those guardians. We need, we need someone watching out for us, don't we? You know, we can all recall that when we were small, young children growing up, our parents watched out for us. Our parents would say, don't do this and don't do that. And as we got a little bit older, we got tired of hearing that. I remember when, when I was very, very young, if, if I, I went to town with my father and, you know, we're walking down the street, crossing the street, he'd always take a hold of my hand, make sure I didn't bolt off and into traffic or whatever and get hurt. And I can remember that as I began to old, got older, I didn't want to hold my dad's hand, you know, that, that was... And we kind of went through that transition period, and then finally we reached a point, you know, I got old enough, and he trusted me, and I no longer had to do that. But he was just watching out for me. And my mother would do the same thing. We all, we all recall and remember that. We need somebody watching out for us, and that's what Jesus does. He's watching out for us. And, and he's, he's done a lot of things to try to, to pave the way for us. Well, something else that we see is, a question we could ask ourselves, do we want God with us? Jesus can help us with that so that God can be our side. 2 Corinthians 13 and 11. Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. We see this word complete as we said very closely associated with the word perfect. He says, be like-minded. As, as brethren, live in peace, get along, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Brethren need to remember that when they're fighting and quarreling and bickering and just can't get along, God's not with us when we do that. That, that kind of repels God. Now, there's a difference between what I've just described and differences. Sometimes brethren will have differences. But there, there's a way to work out those differences. If it's a scriptural matter, we, we can all sit down and reason together with, with open Bibles and with a prayerful attitude. And hopefully we, we can work through that. But some people, they want to get mad. They want to get angry. They want to start drawing lines. Now it's us and them. You and us. And, and, and then one group will sit on one side of the building and another will sit on another side of the building. And if that doesn't work, then there, there's, there's a split. There's a division that, that takes place. And that's tragic when that happens. Well, something else that we see is that Jesus can, can help us from, from stumbling. In, in Jude 24 and verse, 20, in verse 25, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and great with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. I can remember the last few years of my mother, uh, especially the time before she went into the nursing home, her, her walking, she got slower and slower in getting around. And if we went out anywhere, I'd, I'd usually have to, to walk with her, walk very, very slowly, because she could stumble, she could trip, 
It was something we worried about when she, she was on her home, uh, alone at home. And, and, and you all have perhaps gone through some of those very same experiences with, with your loved ones, your parents and grandparents. And it's a process of life. And if we live long enough, it'll probably happen to us. And uh, it's just like, you know, we help our children when they first learn to walk. And they, they stumble around a little bit. But, you know, if they fall down, it's no big deal. Is it? They just pop right back up and, and they go on. But if you're 80, 90 years old and you fall down, it hurts. And sometimes you break things. And, and, and it's either a long convalescence and rehabilitation or sometimes people never recover. They're never able to walk again. So they need help. So they don't stumble. And that's what Jesus does for us. Because without Christ, we stumble. Now it's not a physical stumble, but a spiritual stumble. For we sin. We have a lapse in judgment. Something like that happens, and, and that's why we need Christ's help. And he can help perfect us and make us complete so that we can avoid that stumbling. You know, we, we are also supposed to try to help restore each other. That's one way that, that Christ works with us. You know, it, it's not like he's going to perform some kind of a miracle to keep us from stumbling. Sometimes he works through our fellow Christians. In Galatians 6 and verse 1, Paul said this, Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. We're to help one another. We, we help each other physically, and, and, and that's good. If somebody needs some help or assistance, we're, we're, you know, somebody's usually pretty good about trying to pitch in and help and, and do whatever needs to be done. But we also need to help each other spiritually. And a lot of times we, we don't do any helping unless, well, all of a sudden the person disappears and they never come to services anymore and, and maybe we'll make a phone call or we'll go stop by and visit. But, but really we, we, we need to start making an effort long before that, before it reaches that point, and, and try to, to pick them up. There, there may be some reason, there's some problem there that needs to be addressed. Well, let's look at another word that, that Peter used uh, in our text, and that is the word confirm. Uh, King James Version and Strong's uh, and NIV, NIV uses the word establish, not a word we, we you, usually we say establish, but there's also the word establish. Strong's Accordance also says to turn in a certain direction. And Webster uses the word to Remove doubt. You know, a lot of times we we'll, we'll hear you know, the president or, or somebody in, in government will re receive some news and information. Uh, or, or, or maybe a news agency, they'll, they'll hear something. And one of the first words out of their mouth from the editor is, has that been confirmed? All right. In other words, is that a fact? Yeah, it's important. You don't want to publish fake news, and we see there's been problems with that. In, in the past, in journalism, you want to make sure you're, you're only publishing the truth, but sometimes people don't do that. But that that's what it means to, to confirm, to, to remove the doubt, to turn in a, in a certain direction, and that's something that Jesus can help us with. Jesus can help us turn toward the light. As we mentioned earlier, sin deforms us. It plunges us into darkness and in the world, and Jesus can say, this is the way you need to go. This is the way you need to come. He refers to himself as the door. I am the door. I am the light. I am the way. Come this way. That's what Jesus has done. He has, has made it possible for us to, to find truth. In Acts 26 and verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Jesus helps to open our eyes. There's a lot of people in the world today whose eyes are not open. They've closed them. They, don't, they cannot see the truth. Paul once spoke about how that the gospel to a lot of people is nothing more than foolishness. And that's still true today. A lot of people look at the, at the gospel as, as foolishness. Jesus opens our eyes, helps us to see the truth, turns darkness into light, and helps us to overcome the dominion of Satan. To turn from that and turn to God. Jesus can introduce us to God. 
We all know what an introduction is. You're looking for, you know, maybe you're looking for a new job or something, and someone says, well, there's an employer down the road, and they're hiring. I'll introduce you. And that kind of opens the door. That sometimes happens. In sales, they'll sometimes call that networking. You know, that, that's the reason, you know, they may go to parties and get-togethers and, and various functions so that they can network and talk to people. Strike up relationships that then could lead to a sale, could lead to a new job, prospect, or opportunity. Those introductions are important. And in the same way, Jesus introduces us to God. Jesus once said, we can't get to God unless we go through him. There are some people who say, well, I don't need Jesus. I'll just go directly to God. No, Jesus is our mediator. You want to get to God, you've got to do it through Christ. When we pray to God, we pray through whom? Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. By the authority of Jesus, amen. So that's a very important process. In Galatians 4 and verse 9, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back to the weak and the worthless element things, elemental things, to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? If we pause here for just a moment and recognize that as Paul is writing to some of these brethren in Galatia, they were Jews, and as we've commented many times before, some of them were drifting back into Judaism. They were abandoning their Christian faith and Christ and wanting to go back to the, the law of Moses. And he says, why are you turning back to the weak and worthless elemental things? Now, that could be either back to the law of Moses or to, to worldliness. There's probably not much of a chance of us wanting to go, go back to Judaism, but we do go back to the world and everything that is involved in that. You know, there are some people who think, well, I do know God. I know him very well. And Jesus apparently knew that there were individuals like that. He started off in Matthew 7 and 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. We drop down to verse 23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There's a lot of people say, Oh yeah, I know. I know God. But in reality, they don't. You remember in Acts there was an occasion where where some of the Jews' uh, uh, people were, were trying to exercise demons. And they were trying to do it by the power of Christ, and it just didn't work because they didn't have a relationship with God or Christ. And, and they thought, well, you know, Paul can do this, so we should be able to do it. And you remember the demon said something interesting. Well, we know Paul. And we, we know, yeah, he's associated with Christ, but we don't know you. You, you don't have such association. Those people, they understood that association, but they didn't fully have it because of a, a lack of obedience. And sometimes that happens with people today. Oh, yeah, I'm in good with the Lord. When we're not. I think sometimes Christians, maybe even in the Church of Christ, lie to themselves. We lie to ourselves. We think we're better than what we really are when perhaps there's still sin in our lives. We don't want to hear those words. Uh, on the day of judgment, that Christ doesn't even know us. I don't know who you are. There'll be people say, hey, hey Lord, you're my buddy. How are you doing? And he said, who are you? Who, who are you? Whenever we talk about repentance, I think most of us realize that it's a change in direction. As we get back to this word confirm, also meaning change in direction. And that's what Peter was talking about on the day of Pentecost when he first extended the gospel and he said repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you should receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent, turn about, change your direction. You need to ask yourself this morning, do you need to change your direction in life? If you're going the wrong way, then you need to change. It's kind of like, you know, if you're driving in your car and you're looking for something and you say, well, I'm going the wrong way. Well, you, do you just keep on going the wrong way? No, you turn around. You ask for directions. Pull out your phone. Pull up the GPS. You make sure you get the right directions. Maybe you were heading south and you say, well, I need to be going north. So you do a 180. 
what we need to do in our lives. If we're going the wrong way, then we need to go the right way. And Jesus Christ helps, tells us which way to go. He says, you're going the wrong way. Change your direction. Well, we also need to be strengthened. You know, many times we make announcements and we'll say, well, you know, someone's been sick, they've had surgery, they're weak. Illness can do that to us. Surgery can do that. Accidents, they, they make us weak. You don't, you, all you have to be is off your feet for a few days and it, it really zaps you. And it takes some time to recover, to regain your strength. But how do you do that? By rest. Sometimes rehab, getting up slowly, begin moving around and regaining your strength. Well, that can happen to us spiritually too. Sin can take a lot out of us. Sin can weaken us. Sin continues to weaken us. But Christ can strengthen us to help us cope, to help us be firm. Strong's elaborates even a little further. It says strengthen in spiritual knowledge. We need that, and we can only get that from the Word, from God's Word. Jesus can give us strength to be bold. On the day that I called, thou didst answer me, thou didst make my soul, make my soul, make me bold with strength in my soul. Psalm 138, verse 3. That's what God can help us do. Makes us bold, makes us strong. We need to do that. I'm not saying to be obnoxious, not to be callous, not to be cruel. Not to be saying cutting things to people, but there is a way to be confident and bold with, without going in that direction. We don't want to be watering down the scriptures, whitewashing the scriptures, making, trying to weaken them up a little bit. You know, sometimes people get a cup of coffee and they say, wow, this is strong. So what do you got to do? Well, some people will sugar it. Some people will put some cream in it. Some people may just pour a little water in it, and the water weakens it. Well, that's fine for coffee or tea. <laughs> you know, you, you want it the way you want it. I, I get that. But we can't do that with the truth. We can't do that with gospel. We can't say, oh, that's a little bit strong. We, we, we got we to gotta put some water in the gospel. We got to water it down a little bit. Oh, that truth, that's it's just too strong. Uh, people in social media, they, they won't like that. People in our culture won't like that. We, we got to water it down. Well, that's the problem. People have been watered down God's word for ages, and it begins to have a negative impact on everything. We need to remember that Jesus can also strengthen congregations. Interesting verse found in Acts 16, verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Now, a lot of times churches will say, well, we want, we want to increase in numbers. We want to grow. How do we do that? Well, here's, here's one example. Strengthen your faith. Sometimes we, we think, well, it's just going to happen by magic. Well, we, we've got to strengthen our faith. And that's maybe one of the first things that we need to be looking at is our faith is as strong as it could be. Another word that Peter uses is the word establish. <coughs> or steadfast is used in some of the other translations. Thayer's Greek lexicon talks about to lay the foundation. We need a, we need a good foundation. We talk a lot about uh, the importance of, of a, fam a foundation of being established. That's why we send our children off to get an education. Maybe on to college graduate school, because we want our children to have a, a good, firm foundation upon which they can build their lives and maybe get a job and be able to provide for their families. If not an education, then a skill. Learn a skill. Learn a trade. You need something like that to be, to be able to establish a firm foundation. That's why we teach our children as they're growing up and bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord to give them a firm foundation so that when they are adults and they enter the world, they'll know how to navigate their way through the world and say no to sin, to say no to temptation, and to make God and Christ the master of their lives. 
Jesus can help us establish that faith. In Colossians 2, 6 and 7, And as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Jesus can build us up. We need to look straight ahead. We need to put boundaries on our desires and affections. Here's an interesting Old Testament passage found in Proverbs 4, verses 25 through 27. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. That's what God can do for us. That's what Christ can do. We need to keep our eyes straight ahead. Do you ever remember when you first were learning to drive, your driving instructor, whether you know whether you got to school or, or if it was your parents or grandpa or whatever, they'd say, keep your eyes on the road. Didn't they say that? One thing I learned, and Cindy will tell you I perhaps never learned it, is that if you look off at something over, you, whatever direction you're looking, it just seems naturally that's where you start turning the wheel, isn't it? Oh, look what's over in that field. So he says, you're going to hit the ditch. Why is that? Well, it's kind of like wherever we look, that's where we go. It's true in life. And it's also true with, with us. If, if we start looking at the world, looking this way, we look to the left or the right, as this scripture is saying, we're going to start heading off in that direction. We need to keep our eyes looking directly ahead. In other words, keep it on God. Keep it on Christ. We need to watch where our feet are going. And then, as it says, all our ways will be established. We need to make sure we build the right foundation. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 and 12, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The right foundation is important. Let me ask you a question. You, know, you, can, have a, you can have a beautiful home and you, know, you go in and you, you, got, you put marble on the floor and, and, and you got all kinds of fancy countertops. And, and, you know, and they say, well, I don't want drywall. I, I want plaster walls. I want the top-notch walls. And I want all kinds of, of ornate woodwork, beautiful work, woodwork. And, and, and we're going to have the best fixtures in the back. We want gold-plated fixtures and good carpet and good flooring. And, oh, it's just it's such a, it's a beautiful house. Everyone says, wow, that looks really good. But you built that house on the dirt, just the grass. And there's no foundation. You know what's going to happen to all that beauty eventually? It's going to all start falling apart. House isn't going to stand very long without some kind of a foundation. A lot of people don't get all excited about a foundation. You don't really see it. It's something that's in the ground. And it's something you don't even think about or even want to think about and still, until it begins to fail. And you begin knowing, seeing cracks above your door frames and in the walls and, and you go outside and you see the, the, the settling and that's serious trouble isn't it? Yeah. We're going to have to call people out with hydraulic lifts and jacks and put all kinds of concrete piers and beams underneath. I mean that's an expensive proposition. We need a good foundation. We need to make sure we build on the right foundation or else it doesn't matter how elaborate we may build. It's just not it's not going to persevere and survive. And that's the way it is with us in our lives. We see all kinds of people we, walking around and their lives are crumbling and falling apart. It's because they build on the wrong foundations. They haven't built on Christ or God. They, they built on the world. And that's like that one example of parable that Jesus shared with us about the wise man and the foolish man, one building on a rock and one building on the sand. Too many people are building their lives on the sand. Sometimes even congregations do that in churches. They build on the sand and not on the rock of Christ. And things begin to crumble and fall apart. 
And so our answer is yes, we need Jesus. And the final point of our lesson is as we look at Ephesians 1 and verse 7, it says, And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. We need Christ for forgiveness of sins and redemption. We need Christ so that his blood can, can wash away our sins. Only Christ can do that. You can't find anyone else that, that can do that for you except Christ. Maybe you're here this morning, you're subject in some way to the invitation. We encourage you to come forward, repent of your sins, confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and then we can immerse you in the waters of baptism. Maybe you're a Christian, you've lost your way, you've lost your footing, you've lost your foundation, you've drifted back into the world, but you can come back. You can ask Christ for help, and Christ will always be there, ready, willing, and able to help you. If you're subject in any way, please come forward as we stand.